Baseball tonight. Drive line. Tanner, Tanner, R&D Tanner's podcast. Kind of, what's up? Drive line R&D podcast. Episode 23. I'm Alex Caravan, co-host, co swag manager of baseball so analytics. Well through this wall. It's like <laughs> so weird. Yeah. Um, Brady's in that direction. Say, say that again. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can Both hear you too. Zoom, yeah. Uh, yeah. Brady and I moved into a new spot. Not going to give you a house tour because that's too difficult to manage with. If this uh, video hits 10 likes on YouTube. We'll do a house tour. No, no, no. Hey, hits- once, once, we, uh, once we hit 100 subscribers, we we'll do a house tour. We hit subscribers on the Driveline okay. RD podcast channel. House tour immediately. Or, or we do that Russian army fitness test I linked you guys. Both. We do the Russian oh. army fitness test inside the new house while we... Drinking a uh, something that's very hard to tell from the sun, gl- nice. sun, sun reflection on it, but Elysian, so the sun, it's like a uh, also drinking ale, the- ale with black limes. Actually, pretty fire. I don't know, I don't know what you thought, Brady, Salute but also sun. introduce yourselves. It's uh, it's all right. I'm Anthony Brady, biomechanist, drive line baseball. Uh, yeah, also drinking the Salute the Sun Research and Drinks podcast, episode 23. Kyle Lindley, uh, RD engineer. Slash biomechanist. Um, I'm drinking a Bodhisattva IPA Ooh. from Georgetown Brewing, uh, local, very good beer. Uh, it's one of my favorites. And one thing that I really like about this can um, my sister's boyfriend drinks IPAs warm because apparently that's like uh, in some places that's like the right way to drink them, like maybe more flavor or something. Like, and how this warm are we talking? Just like, uh, just like room temperature, just not cold, which is, I'd never heard of it before. So I was like, yeah. oh, maybe that is the way to drink beer. I, I thought it was a case uh, for like porters and stouts. Maybe. I don't, I don't think that was a case for, I'm pre- okay, keep going, but I'm, I'm pretty down to call out, even though I'm not like a beer snob by any means, uh, I'm pretty down to call out your sister's boyfriend. <laughs> um, it was a little odd. It says, it says, please refrigerate, warm beer sucks. And I had never, I have never resonated with wow. uh, a, a different statement more than this. We, have, first, we still have one of those beers. I'm not, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm too sold, Caravan. On, on these? You don't like them? I think it's like B tier. It's what? Like B tier. It's like third tier. Oh, B tier. I thought you were saying like B. It's all right. It's all right. Yeah. What's, we, we, we have one of those Bodhisattvas in the beach house, I think. We have one beer no, in that fridge. No. You, I got you, you crushed out. it? I I've, I've, I've thought we did, and I got really, oh, really? excited because I was at the house earlier when I was get, grabbing that stuff. And I was starting to clean out the fridge, and I saw the box. There's a box of Bodhisattva uh, in there. I was like, oh, uh, let's go. Classic mix-up. There's a can, and then there was nothing in there. An empty box. There was a can? And there was an empty can in the box in the fridge? No, no, no. Just an empty box. Okay. Oh. That empty like, can in, the bo- in an empty... That would, that would be off. ruthless. That would have pissed me off. You know what we should do? We yeah. should... Uh, Fremont's open today, right? We should, we should head there later, later tonight. Get some, get some nice beers? Yeah, pick up a couple. You can get singles there. You can get single 16ers, like the ones that uh, Jeff and I got. Yeah, yeah, those look good. I, I thought, honestly, thought a stop and shop near us uh, was going to have more variety. It doesn't have too much variety. Yeah, we should definitely, uh, especially with dip, you guys dip, are close to that whole like slew of, uh, oh, yeah, breweries yeah, room, too. Room brewery Central. Yeah. Can't wait to go to Ruben's. Shout out Dr. Yeah, buddy. Son. Thank you for the birthday present. And we have to make sure to not forget, uh, to mention the sponsorship opportunity to them next time yep. we go. We get a giant Ruben's, Ruben's logo on this TV for like $20 a beer a month. Yeah, we'll just uh, yeah, we'll just give them a big shout out right now. Ruben's beers in Ruben's Ballard, Bruce, uh, Washington, Ballard, really, really Ruben's awesome Bruce beers. Room, this way, no, no, no. This way, this way, we'll have data. We'll say like, you see that spike in sales after uh, July twentieth. That's yes. yeah, that was our podcast. You're welcome. And if we don't have a spike, we'll say we we're sandbagging it. Exactly. As, right. as I sandbagged Lindley on the Twitter race. Yes. God damn it. Yep. Uh, Updates. Hey, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, we have a couple of updates on the podcast as well. Um, we'll talk about it later about Lindley, uh, Lindley's R&D marketing hub, but we're posting some clips on the main Driveline channel as well. So again, if you guys are one of the OG 100, we'll have some nice either merch or discount or <laughs> most likely late, just a shout out. Run Squad <laughs> t-shirts. Yeah. Dude. I'm down to make some merch. Uh, this is uh this is good. Con- this is good uh, content for the for the segment. Let's let's save it for the segment. 
Good. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Updates. Last week, uh, for me, I attended Pitch Doc 2020, which is a softball pitching clinic conference put on by ST Breakthrough in Chicago. The second really cool. best uh, sport related conference last week. Go on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And Abs was last week too, but Pitch Doc was cool. Um, I learned, learned a bunch. Uh, there was some really interesting pitch design talks bunch of integration between like people talking about integrating uh, skill development with strength and conditioning, which is something that we talk about in baseball and other sports as well a lot, but um, it was cool hearing that. And then also uh, a lot of talk about posture and the midsection and everything, which has been a hot topic and on the podcast pitching. Uh, pitching. It was a pitching conference. Yeah. So um, yeah, that was really cool. Um, it was nice hearing from all those people learning, learning a little bit more about that. So eventually if we end up getting into softball, we can have a little bit more of a footing there. Um, we also launched today, actually measurables is a, I think it's a podcast, but a little bit ago they, they, uh, I actually heard about it from caravan. Um, but they are putting on like a office hours. People volunteer to volunteer some time for office hours for people that are underrepresented uh, underrepresented in the, in the, in the sports analytics community. So they can kind of sign up for slots and, and have little office hours with you. So that launched today, um, which is cool. And then. And yeah. I already have more people signed up for me uh, than Lindley does. What is it? What is it? Four one? one. Uh, uh, four. No, one of them's fake and one of them was a double <laughs> sign-up. Whoa, one of them is dude. Off. Fake, Whoa, dude. drama, yeah. controversy. Heard of your yeah. okay, dude. podcast. Listen, man, we're trying to offer to community something. Don't, no, don't, no, be no, calling, no, no. don't be calling my sign-ups. Don't be calling my sign-ups fake, dude. Slots. Don't be calling my sign-ups fake. Wow. No, dude. Caravan's just upset that he's about to uh, lose to the comeback of the century on Twitter followers, so he's got to wow. try to one-up me on uh, office hours, office hour sign-ups. The thing is, I don't have to try, though. Uh, I mean... You, I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess that's a good point. That's <laughs> a good point. Like right, right up to like shock's light, faces. Uh, like light, uh, something when, when things get like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like red. yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much my, my update. Second week open. Things are rolling pretty smoothly. Do you want to talk about apps conference? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, Caravan, you should go into your updates first because I don't really have any because it's moving. I, I don't really have much either. I finished traveling, finished moving in, uh, did some black ops work, fixed some bugs on some of our internal tools, but n- n- nothing too exciting. Yeah, my, I mean, my week was uh, basically moving like the whole first week until you got here. Hanging Eating out, dicks. Making sure internet got installed, which was a pain. And then uh, Abs Conference. Inaugural annual ABBS American Baseball Biomechanics Society, which which uh which uh Brady is the founder and president of. I am not the as, founder. As, I'm not the president. That would be Glenn Fleissig. I am on I'm, the uh, uh, board of directors though for the ABBS. We had our first founding like, sponsor though, right? What's up? Founding sponsor though, right? Driveline Baseball is the founding sponsor. Yep. Uh, which is represented by Anthony Brady. Dot or comma CSCS. Yes, which is represented by the primary host of the Driveline R and D uh, podcast. Going if we're gonna go. Uh, we had a three day conference, <laughs> one hour each day. It went it went basically long each day, but yeah, just talking about like biomechanics uh, in baseball. Um, introduced the society of what we're doing. Kind of a. Uh, couple different things. I think a lot of it though is um, much like ASB, ISBS, like all these other, you know, societies uh, create some networking. Also just create like opportunities for people and like platforms for like one thing that we did that that I think is like really cool is we had a panel each day about like baseball biomechanics in academia, baseball biomechanics in major league baseball, baseball biomechanics in industry. So like kind of like the three areas that if you were going to get into baseball and biomechanics, you could find like a career path in. And so we had a bunch of people from each area on the panel. It was like, how did you get there? You know, what did you do to get there? What kind of like steps did you take? What do you look for in people? So giving, you know, tons of resources and information to anyone out there that's like, you know, I like, bi- I like baseball, I like biomechanics. What are my career uh, possibilities here? And, and so 
Yeah, I was able to actually, I got to moderate the baseball and industry panel, um, which have, have either of you ever moderated a panel before? No, I, don't think so. I, I also regrettably or, miss, missed that, uh, that one. Cause I was at the facility. Uh, I'm pissed. Don't worry about it. It's all recorded. Just so everyone knows, uh, the whole conference is recorded. It'll be up on the ABBS YouTube page later. Uh, it's yeah, that was my question. We could do a, we could watch it on like next week's podcast as like a live reaction from YouTube. S- s- sounds very, sounds very popular. Sounds very uh, viewer friendly, appealing. Dude, next, next, uh, next week we'll have our first guest. What are you talking about? That was true. I guess we could do a. I guess we do a live reaction of the guest. That's our whole interview. Yo, There's man, a, sit here and give us your... Uh, Moderating is kind of tough. I, I'd never done it before. I was talking to Bryce and getting some help and tips. How large is the panel? Huh? How large is the panel you're Four moderating? Four people. Four people. Four? And I knew two of them. I didn't know the other two. Um, but yeah, it, it was good. I, I think it went well. Um, but it, it's kind of a weird thing to, to moderate. Because like, I've been on a couple of panels and it's always like the question you want to like figure out an answer for it but when you're moderating it's like you you're you conscious of, of what it sounds you want like to yeah respond or like you want to yeah. answer to it but that's not like what you do uh kind of a thing do you ever do you ever like cut off people because you're just like going off in a tangential direction you're like okay okay but no, the question was no uh, i think i got really lucky because all the panelists were like very like i think they'd all done it before i mean there is a good good panel Questions were also pretty easy. We didn't have too much time. Like we only had like 20, 25 minutes. So I think I actually went too long and it was pretty easy with the zoom setup because like when you're moderating the panel, there's like a Q and a box and it just pops up and like people like questions if they want them answered. So really if there was silence, I just had to be like, okay, so we got this question yeah. and I would just hit them with it. And there's some, there's some interesting uh, questions. How many parties? presentations were there in total? How many presentations? Oh man. I think there had to be at least a dozen. There was like four to five each day. It was like people would have like five minute poster presentations. And then like a couple of people had like longer slideshow, full on presentations talking about like emerging technologies, uh, research presentations, all that stuff. Yeah, it's, all, for, it's all going to be uh, uploaded to YouTube. It was all recorded. For the, for the part, uh, for the parts that I caught, I got basically all of day one and day two, but none of day three. Um, I was very yeah, impressed with how the one day where I was a moderator panel and then I was on the panel at the end too. I know. Yeah, Lindley I know. figured he'd, uh, Lindley figured you'd talk about it on the podcast. He didn't want to, he didn't want to spoil himself. That's, that's the same reason I missed uh day one through three. So, um, I was, hey, I was except dance talk, three. except they, except dance talk. I hopped in for dance talk. Uh, yeah. Ahead, yeah. <laughs> what I was saying, um, we, I was impressed with how like, you said it went over each day, but I don't think it went over like too much. And I think it's, that's like the easiest thing for those conferences to do to go over time and kind yeah. of lose the schedule. I thought, I thought it was done pretty well. Yeah, like the, sure. the short presentations, the poster presentations were like, they were kept very short. Uh, the people presenting were super like uh, to the point and, and got their message. I thought it was really good. And uh, then Dan, Dan, Dan had a presentation. Yeah. Dan's presentation was really good. I also thought the GIF on the poster was Swaggy, genius. Huh? That was so yeah. sick. And then the, so the third thing was that this third thing was that I, um, it's like easy to get a different view or like be opened up to the, to baseball biomechanics from the academia, uh, perspective through, from the conference, because our driveline, a lot of our research is more applied, less, um, less like academic type research. We're doing more um, things that are like oriented around applying the stuff. And it's, it's cool hearing. I honestly didn't know there was this much academic research going on in the baseball society. I thought it was uh, a lot of it was like what we were doing, uh, basically in, in gym. So it was really cool hearing from, uh, like Arnell just published one or just, uh, posted one today that he was going to do an ISPS. Yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, PLNU, uh, Auburn. Auburn. Yeah. Auburn. Yeah. It's pumping out, you know, like papers left and right. Uh, mm-hmm. baseball Doc, Dr. Oliver presented at Pitch Talk as well. She yeah, she presented at awesome. uh, ABS on, on uh, was it Wednesday? No way. And, oh, and then, or, uh, yeah, and then she did the, she did Pitch Talk the next morning. Yeah. Dude, she's, she's awesome. That's, wow. Yeah. So that was ABS. Uh, I'm, 
I'm really now that it's like really getting going. I'm even more and more excited about like being a part of it and the initiatives. And like, I think there's so much we could do for. What, what do you guys have lined up going forward? Yeah, uh, we have another another meeting coming up, more of like a almost business related um, into like what we're what we're trying to do. But I think a lot of uh, early initiatives are going to be like standardized definitions. Um, you know, like sort of like community guidelines. Not, not community oh, guidelines. like the biomech version of uh, active spin, active spin, spin efficiency. Yeah, yeah like standard, <laughs> standard, like practice stuff. You know, um, and I think like where it could go years from now would be huge, right? Because imagine if like we could compare our data set with like Auburn's lab, Wake Forest lab, like regardless of technology, you know, and like just some established like basically in a paper you just say we use the ABBS certified model or whatever it is, you know, so, certified pod, you know, whatever it happens to be. And it's like, Oh, great. Now we can cross reference as well. It's the thing. It's going to be so, yo, yo. So who, who's the, maybe, maybe for people that are more in a sabermetrics and, and getting into biomechanics, who, who are the baseball biomechanics equivalent of, uh, Alan, Nathan, Tom Tango and Barton Smith in that conversation. Oh, definitely Glenn. Glenn is like, Glenn, Glenn is which one? Glenn, Glenn is Glenn, Glenn's most, Tango. Like, you think Glenn's you know, Tango? Most renowned published baseball biomechanist i mean he has like well over so glenn's like nathan then kind yeah, of he's, right he's probably like nathan he's got like over 250 plus publications okay um, and then who do you think who do you think's tango tango so that's like but that's like also a guy that's been like around for a long time right yeah yeah tango's been around for a bunch and and, and has like uh he's probably like the more applicable or he's probably like yeah like the more kind of i mean actually i don't know i don't know if I mean, I mean, you know more about Tango than I probably know about any of the biomex yeah, mechanisms. I don't know if we can make tough. a clear link. The, yeah, I think the parallels honestly might stop after Nathan and, and Glenn. Uh, like Robert Shapiro's on the board. He, he's been doing baseball biomechanics since like the late 70s with like okay. manual digitization and that stuff. Um, honestly, I mean, I think like Ben, is, like being on the board with Ben is really cool. Like with what he's done with uh, Modus and, and everything early on. And now like him transitioning into White Sox and Pro Ball. I mean, he has a ton of- uh, Oh, Ben could be ben, 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 ben could be Tango Light then, right? Cause that, he yeah, kind of like did his own thing. Tango, Tango did his own thing. Tango had like a book published yep. before getting into MLB AM and being like the senior data architect or whatever. Is, yeah, yeah is I, could, there. I could definitely see that. It's, it's kind of tough though, because a lot of people within baseball biomechanics are usually working in pro ball or have been yeah. like some of the best ones, like um, Doug Whiteside with the Yankees and, and stuff that he's done. Uh, Ryan Croton with the Angels. Yeah, yeah, Cron, 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 Cron the homie. Yeah. Um, there's there's, Dr. there's Cron quite a bit. a bit of baseball biomechanics, but a lot of them have been like, just like affiliated with teams Yeah, for quite a while. So this is a really cool opportunity for some of the information, knowledge that they have to kind of like, you know, uh, open the cap on it. Is it harder to publish open source stuff when you work for a pro ball team like it is on the kind of data science point of view? Yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure because like even Croton's publications, I'm pretty sure they weren't on his own players. It's like he had to go yeah. like, run an independent yeah. study on like yeah high school, anything like, on yeah. people. You no, know? and then that's, a, what, that's what ASM that's why like ASMI just like pumps out research. They just like they're similar to us and that they're like. A, you, know, you just collect everything and then people come yeah. in and then they use their like biomechanical data for publications or somebody asked a question about that too um i think the board was it was nakamura uh ben and then who who's the guy on the with the orioles ethan stewart yeah yeah so somebody asked them about like uh, something to the effect of, are they able to get their, their research, uh, open, like basically open access and like allow their research to be seen by the public and by the general baseball industry. And it was kind of a tough question for them, yeah. like working for teams. Cause it's like a proprietary thing, competitive advantage thing. Yep. They basically just said that like, um, a lot of it ends up like trickling around, not from a publication, but like the information starts to kind of like people start seeing things similarly just through like the chain of uh, like individual like uh, people's networks yeah. and everything. And then so like the the information ends up getting out um, somehow. Yeah, but, I think the, um, as far as like data analysts go, they're just going to be like, it's way easier for them because like that stuff's like publicly available. You know, that was actually a question yeah. I got. 
in the panel that I was moderating because uh, Kenny Track Scott was on that one. Um, and someone like asked him, he was a representative from Kenny Tracks, and was like, there was a question about data ownership and like who does the player get their data? Like whose data? If you have these stadium markerless technologies up and running, who, who gets that data? And he had, he answered, honestly, he's like, it's the team's data. The team paid for Kenny Tracks to get installed, team's data. So like, it's not like as a biomechanist for that yeah. team, you can just come in and be like, I'm going to write a study on all this data. You, you might not even be able to access it, right? It's like up to the team of how they do it, which is a big, like, and that's a whole like ethics thing that I've been, I mean, I brought up that question at Slugfest, you know, I've been, so I've always thought that's a really weird area just of like baseball data rights, ownership, tech, all that stuff. So I think that's a, that's always going to be like a big limiting factor there. It's like with if the statistical outcomes, there's no ownership of that. It's just public data, right? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't work for a pro team. Uh, honestly, it might be a better question for Dan. So if you want to, if you want to have Dan answer that question on uh, next episode, go vote, go for, vote him for him. Poll. We're, we're okay. informally closing the poll at a. Uh, uh, Monday at noon. I, I I said it for three days. I don't know why. I don't, I just thought you could close it. Uh, you know, I think you close it ahead of time. So I was like, I don't think I've gotten any votes in the last like six hours. I said like, okay, I'll do it for three days and I'll close it earlier. But uh, yeah, feel yeah, free I'm, to visit my Twitter uh, to access that poll and interact with that with my yeah. Uh, visit it. Retweeto. Go ahead. Follow him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> follow him. Won't change anything. Yeah. Um. um should we move on to R&D content creation? Yeah. Yep. This could be a, a pretty quick one. It's just like this week, uh, we kind of got started with some planning for how we can uh, disseminate what like some of the stuff that we're doing in the research and development department at Driveline to like the public and to the rest of the company as well. It's like something that we're trying to address with the podcast, obviously. Yeah. But, and, um, and, and, and I was going to say, even more, more high-level overview-wise, uh, we basically have our marketing department which has traditionally been a little bit either understaffed or kind of overwhelmed by certain projects is trying to get a lead from each department of the company to contribute and have that kind of trickle down to that department. So Lindley is the R and D lead. We have like HP leads, pitching floor leads, hitting floor leads. Actually, I, I don't, do you know who all the other leads are? I, I don't know off the top yeah. of my head. Uh, Stefan's for HP, Dudo's for hitting. Spencer's for pitching. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So there, we're just like, it's an attempt to get more representation uh, in marketing from the actual departments to get more like, I don't know, like more salient. Inf- I don't know how to describe it. More salient information, more like not accurate, but just like more involvement from the actual people that are doing the, the application of what we're doing. Uh, and I think that can improve the content that we put out. So uh, basically it's just in like some of the things involved are creating ways that we can organize ideas, creating ways to like efficiently complete ideas uh, as far as like video ideas and video editing or like picture ideas or blogs and things. And then we're going to like set up uh, basically set up goals, um, KPIs to shoot for. Like we want to be able to publish uh, continually publish blogs. We want to continually get as many research studies out. We want to uh, continue growing the podcast, making sure the content's as good in there, making sure the production's as good as possible. Um, shoot for like new products, like do our best at uh, kind of illustrating their value, the things that we make here uh, to the public, so that we can um, obviously get get the most uh, value out of out of uh, the stuff we're we're like spending time on. So. Um, yeah, and we I'd love also to hear if any of the listeners or viewers are like have ideas or uh, feedback or things you guys want to learn more about. Um, all that stuff is really good information and gives us good ideas for like uh, not even just like small things like tweets and stuff to put out or blogs to put out, but even could turn into big research products or projects that uh, we can we can do in the drive on research department. So yeah, that's what uh, a lot of that's about. Guess, do anything Lindley's, more on that? Lindley's taking lead on the uh, content creation to further his chances at winning the Twitter bet with Caravan. So. And I, I was saying, I was saying, I thought it, I thought it sucked his chances because now 
in theory, any good content creation should be going to corporate account. So if you guys see, I mean, if you guys see anything, Lindley wow, tweeting anything boy. good, that's not on a corporate account. Then that's how you know Lindley cares more about winning a Twitter bet with me and then furthering dreadline marketing. But you're so saying this. You let's, can observe, say this is, let's observe Lindley's Twitter over the next couple of weeks and just to see. Yeah. Just how much high quality point. content he puts out. That's on the corporate account. Yeah. Keep yeah, keep yeah. observing my Twitter. Keep uh, interacting with those tweets. Ooh, it's going to help me. Yeah, help me in the long run. I think um, what, what I think you're misunderstanding, Caravan, is that I'm not the only one responsible for contributing towards the corporate uh, social media and mark or content. Uh, platforms. The whole company is. I'm just trying to help promote those and organize those ideas. So if you're saying that I would be selfish for putting stuff on my personal account, same goes for you. I mean, that's why I don't put Gosh, anything on there. Uh, that's, yeah. that's why I'm putting anything on there, dog. <laughs> oh, I thought you were sandbagging so that you could. <laughs> I'm a sandbag again. I'm a sandbag again so we can double or nothing on our way to 1505. You'll be like, yeah, I might lose a 1500, but give me five more followers. I'm catching that shit up. Live, live audible. Uh, let's up the bet, up the bet stakes and just race to 2000 where it really matters. Nah. Let's ra- let's race to 2000 and put a little bit more on the bet. Dude, I'm telling you, I think I could like, nah, I think Lin- <laughs> Lindley- I'm taking my win, baby. I'm taking my win. <laughs> Lindley? So I ain't pulling sad. a Lindley. I'm taking my win. Wait, how close is caravan to winning? Eight, eight or 180 or some 175 followers away. I think you're going to be, I think you might run into trouble caravan with the lab being back up and everything. Cause I mean, it's not really selling out, but if Lindley really wanted to, he could sell out and just go super ham on biomechanics gifts all day. So well, also, I got, I got Lindley, a couple, I, mean, I got a couple, want to throw me a couple bones. I could throw a few threads together. Come on, dude. Through. Come on, dude. You know, we, I, got a couple cards I, don't, in my I don't need that disrespect, Anthony. I can get my own threads, bro. Okay. Hey, Caravan, you want a couple threads? I want a couple bones. You Listen, man. Couple, Listen, man. You want a couple bones? No, I want, want it. I want them. I want them. I want them. Yeah, you, get, you give me a couple bones, make a couple threads, throw them okay. in Google Docs, send them over to you, some GIFs. Technically, those, those things should be going to the corporate account. <laughs> Yo, Anthony. Brady, I'm coming over to your hey, room man, right after to this. Man, the highest dude. bidder. I got Caravan with $3 <laughs> in front of me. We accept Cash App, PayPal, Venmo. Yeah. You know what that is? That's right. two Dick's Cheeseburgers right there. That's right. That's right. Uh, I'll deliver them free, too. I'll go to Dick's and bring them. <laughs> uh, let's, let's get the uh, Carrot Chat. Let's get into the next Carrot Chat. Oh. Carrot Chats. Yeah, it's Carrot Chat time. Hey Colin, hey Colin, my voice might sound like steel wool, but I know that's enough to make you. It actually down. sounds way better now. Really? I've been practicing. <laughs> uh, Honestly, the new okay. house is just like a whole upgrade for you and your your aesthetic on the podcast. I think. You think so? Yeah, I mean, you've got. Just I mean, I think it's way got, better than the. I think it's a yeah. combination, like. The camera seems way better, but I actually think it's mainly just the natural light. The camera, yeah, the camera's not any better. It's the same camera, yeah. But, I, I think it probably it must just be the natural light because you look good. Um, That's also a fire definitely. background, the fireplace, yeah. and then a bookshelf. You can't see the bookshelf. You gotta, you oh. gotta be- get oh, need a better. Oh, by the way, oh, this is a fun thing for uh, followers. Let me fun briefly thing show or followers. Uh, let me briefly show mine. Wait, Lindy, have you seen mine and Brady's paintings from no. Wine and Paints? Really quick. Try to guess which one's which. Try to guess. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I need some context. Did you guys pregame wine and wine and paints? No, no. We just we just drank a lot of wine at the wine and paint. It was when we were at home in Idaho. It was a, a go on a date with my mom. Take my mom out uh, to wine you, and paints when I go home for Thanksgiving. Caravan joined, and this so, was the wine and paint night. All right. Which one you do you think is mine? And which one do you think is Brady's? I think uh, Caravan's is on the left. So in Our left. Caravan's, so right in Caravan's hand. right hand. Yeah. Is it mine? Yeah. That is definitely yours. Can you, can you see the name on it? <laughs> That's Caravan's. Okay. Moving on. Yeah. So, okay, so uh, linear. You were correct. <laughs> Linear, linear regression. I got your um, number, Caravan. I got your number, bro. Also, Not Caravan just glossed over my uh, MRIs and X-rays uh, displayed on the mantle as well. Per, per I didn't day. gloss them over. I turned them down, dude. <laughs> I'm not trying to puke. Trying to eat, dude. 
that hurts. All right, care chat. Uh, so figured, figured we'd briefly cover one of the more popular, one of the more popular forms, well, the most popular form of kind of very basic machine learning and predictive modeling, just a simple linear regression. Uh, and I think in general, it, it kind of fall, you know, when people first get into building models, linear regression should be your first real, real attempt. It's very easy to interpret. It matches up with what most people think of when they try to think of like something predicting something, you know, you build a, yeah, exactly. Correlation. Um, that, 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 what's up? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, a lot of times you'll be surprised that a linear regression will still be the highest performing type of model. Maybe you'll have to change the variable, like one of the input variables into the output, you know, like the thing that you're using to predict the output. So say you're using like, uh, like something simple, you say you're using like K percentage to predict ERA, right? Like some, like any model out there will have something like that. Like some form yeah. of how much, how often a pitcher gets whiffs will factor into his performance on a runs allowed skill. Right? right. So a lot of times, like m maybe that itself, like, you know, the K percentage, cause that'll range from like 15% to 35% and the ERA will range from two to five. So those are on the same scale, yeah. but people transform variables. So maybe it's shifting it, shifting it down by a variable or shifting it down by a constant, applying some sort of uh, operation to the input variable. So forth, like a bunch of times, like, like a popular one is applying the log of the variable and then all of a sudden a linear scale that way. A, t a ton of times linear regression will still work out the best. And maybe you bring in multiple variables, you build, uh, you build a, a larger model out. So I, I think oftentimes people are too quick to hop from linear regression to more complicated stuff, neural nets, yeah. a random forest, uh, uh, you know, wh whatever the situation calls for or whatever, like you think uh, will make the most sense. So I kind of want to cover a couple good situations to use linear regression in and to attempt like to like at least exhaustively like get a benchmark from that. Cause if, if your newer cluster model can't improve a, 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 on top of linear regression, then it's, you're not really doing that much, right? You need to like yeah. go back and, and look more into what your variables are and, and their nature. So, Dude, Dan, uh, Dan got a question about like, Oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Actually, actually, yeah. 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 So, so that's actually one of the, one of the things that made me think of it. And, um, I'll cover that briefly. Um, Dan got asked a question about L O E S S versus linear regression. And, um, L O E S S is basically like a locally weighted, uh, curve. So it's ba like you essentially, it'll, it'll look like a kind of a polynomial regression, but only because it, it fits to each of the local points. So, so it's, it's kind of like a rolling average, right? Oh, uh, like, like, uh, uh yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, in a sense. Yeah. Like, so it'll, it'll, it'll be like, uh, fit to the, the, the population might span across a range of X values and then the curve will fit the actual X, uh, the actual, uh, actual value. So like a good way to visualize it, if you're familiar with geometry at all, uh, would be like sine cosine, like a sine, co like a sinusoid is like very locally weighted, right? Cause it's undulates up and down based on like where it is on, in terms of, uh, the X variable. So the like original LOESS curve kind of approximates a sine wave. Um, it, I think it's technically called locally estimated scatter plot smoothing, but, and you can apply different weights to it. You can, you can weigh like certain, ver certain like X ranges more heavily. So it, it overfits to that, but a linear regression is just like a straight line and, you know, might be positive, might be negative, might be flat. Like in which case you, that kind of tells you that linear regression isn't the best thing. Right. So, uh, a couple things I wanted to kind of cover over. Um, it, the, the assumption should be that whatever your transformed input and output are, there is some sort of linear relationship, right? So if you do put it on, if you can get any sort of linear regression that's not close to flat, then I think it's like worth investigating. Right. Um, a lot of times the idea is uh, a lot of times you'll see a lot of noise. So a lot of times like noise might mean outliers might mean like there's a ton of jitter in the point. So if you, if you can figure out if the noise is like, that's what it is. I mean, just like 
a little bit of noise or if the outliers actually mean something. If it's just a little bit of noise, that's natural when building a model. And if you can figure out a way to smooth that or remove the noise, then linear regression still makes sense. If, however, your your outliers aren't actually outliers and like, you know, those are legitimate values that will keep reoccurring. In that case, linear regression probably doesn't make sense because it, it, it's very, it's just going to try either going to try heavily overfitting the outliers or not keep those in mind. So if the outliers are in fact legitimate data points that you need to account for, linear regression doesn't always uh, make the most sense. Right. Um, another time it doesn't make too much sense is if you have multiple variables and there's a lot of collinearity, which is something I've covered in the podcast before. Uh, but collinearity is when the variables itself explain, it help explain it like the, another of the input variables. So in my previous example, if you're building something to account for like runs allowed or ERA or whatever, like kind of proxy metric you want there and using K percentage, mm-hmm. you'd be using, if you're using K percentage and K, uh, K to walk ratio, clearly those are pretty heavily collinear, right? If you have a high, high K percentage, you're probably also going to have a high K to walk ratio. Obviously they're not the exact same variable, right? Like K percentage just accounts for how many whiffs you get. K to walk ratio accounts for, you know, how often you're walking hitters as well, but there's going to be a ton of collinearity there. So if you're using linear regression right. and using variables that are collinear, those will often overfit. So that, that, uh, that, you know, you want to make sure you have variables that themselves explain different parts of the variance of the output variable. And another big thing, um, Another two big things that I've actually kind of talked about before is metric normalization, uh, linear regression. The last often, linear regression is often heavily helped by normalizing everything, having everything on the same kind of scale. So going back to my previous example, even if it doesn't make sense at first to visualize a relationship between K percentage, because that's between like 15 to 35 percent, and ERA, which is between two and five. If instead we normalize all that, so you know the ERA. And the K percent is on the same scale of like negative two to two, negative two to two, where zero is the mean of each variable. That will often help you make better and more consistent predictions. And it'll also be a huge benefit. And this kind of ties, goes hand in hand with what I said, when both the input and output variables have a normal or Gaussian distribution. So when they follow like a traditional bell curve, that'll be much easier to build a linear regression if it's like a skew distribution where it's like a long tail or most of the data is concentrated in one area you'll often find that linear regression is not the best move so one of the things i do usually so wait, when building if it, if it is a normal distribution that that linear normal distribution will, will help with the linear reg- regression yeah because 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 the, like a way to think about it if you like visualize like a you know a, a steady line and a bunch of points sprinkled throughout most of the points will be concentrated yeah, yeah. Most of the points will be concentrated, like in the middle, spread out. They thin out. Right. Um, if all the points are like concentrated here, kind of a big clump, and then only a few here, the linear regression, like that big middle section that of the linear regression, will be like based off very few points, right? Because it'll be, uh, you know, it'll be swayed by where like a few points are in the meaty middle section that's missing way more data than it would be if it was normal. So, so that's kind of like a quick overview. Uh, and, and just like to bring it back to applicability, one of the very first things I do when looking at a possible like multi-variable model where I'm bringing in multiple variables to predict one other variable. And, and Brady seen me do this over my over my shoulder when I was doing validations for KVS and BLAST and DK is just build a huge pair plot structure. And I probably mentioned it when I, when I, in that episode too, where I'm looking at each variable against another variable and just seeing like, Okay, do these have a linear pattern? Do these have a distinct non-linear pattern, right? Because the, the worst is kind of where it's just like noise. If it's just like a, a blob of points, it's like, okay, maybe maybe I ought to rescale uh, a variable or maybe there's nothing here. Maybe it's just straight noise. But it's really important to be able to tell if certain relationships, because if, if one, say one had a log relationship, then I could take the log of the input variable and then it would be, a would be able to apply like a pretty high performing linear regression. So uh, yeah. Case in point, just summarize or just always make sure whether through a scatter plot or whatever kind of visualization you want, try to understand what variables share a linear relationships, which ones share a distinctly nonlinear one, and which ones are just noise and going to be hard to account for with whatever model you choose. What would be like the, uh, I guess, like the big harm uh, of, I guess, going to a polynomial too early? 
Overfitting. Just overfitting. Just over, overfitting like a motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah. Because this, this thing about, even think about like the simplest, the sim, even think about the simplest like polynomial, like say x squared, right? Mm-hmm. Y equals x squared. And then like it's good through three points. And then like when it's like four, you know, it's like, holy shit, that's, that's, that's shooting up, you know? Yeah. I can, can I ask my question with Hit ASMR? It. What do you say the proportion of uh, regression models that you use are linear? Um, we kind of a, kind of an interesting question because a lot of times, I mean, I mean, pr- pretty decent proportion, uh, especially because a lot of times what I, what I do is rather than spending like multiple days on finding the absolute best model, uh, we're just looking to like validate like proxies, you know? So a lot of times we're like, okay, does this correlate with this? So, so if I get that question, I get that question a bunch, right? Does this correlate with this? So in that case, I'm trying to put it on a linear scale or at least help explain like, oh yeah, it correlates with this up to this point. So disregard crazy wonky values outside of this range. Um, in this like kind of bin range, it correlates with it. So I, I, I do like quite a bit of, but like, I don't want to say, you know, like it's not even like full blown out models. It's just answering discrete questions by trying to look. And I, th- I think, I think Lindley, I think you can attest to this too with some of the R and D requests you've been doing, yeah. right? Like a lot of, a lot of times it's like, rather than build out something that perfectly, pred- not perfectly, but you know, minimizes the RMSE or minimizes whatever error procs you're doing. You're just looking at shaping certain variables in relation to each other and then being, being able to look at it and be like, okay, does this make sense? Is there something there, you know? And yeah. uh, so in, in that case, in that case, quite a bit, right? Because even if like, even if there's like a log relationship, you kind of, you can easily take a log of that and then make it a linear one. So like it's a, yeah, that, that was, a, it's like a good first check to see if there's yeah. any relationship between you. Uh, the, the other thing uh, that I was asking, is it still considered linear regression if you transform a variable, but with a log uh, or like some exponential maybe? Like, is that, I mean, you're still using a linear regression like test, but if you were to make a model based off the log of one of the variables, is it st- like it's you wouldn't? I don't know. I think uh, previously I pr- I wouldn't have considered that uh, a linear relationship or like I guess I guess there's a difference between linear relationships and then using a linear regressional model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's it's a little bit. It can be a little bit boiled down to semantics, I guess. But the yeah. way I look at it is, if your output, if your end output model is a straight line. That's a that's a linear regression, right? Yeah. So if, if yeah, that, that includes sense. transforming one of the input variables to uh, the log of that variable, you know, you wouldn't say the act the input variable and the output have a linear relationship, but you say like the transformed one and, mm-hmm. and the output have a linear relationship. Yeah, that makes sense. Fire. Fire. All right. Yeah. I, uh, with uh, research requests, that's a lot of like at least for mine. You could add a little bit. Lindley's frozen. We lost. Oh, Lindley. yo, yo, let's take over the podcast. We lost right. Lindley mid podcast. <laughs> Wait, is he there? Oh, he's back. Lindley, you froze. Oh, Are you there? Bro, I just got a internet connection unstable notification. What, yeah, what'd you, just, you say? He just froze. Oh, we just talked a bunch of shit face about you. Like... <laughs> <laughs> he just froze. Oh, no. Uh, I was going to just, I was just saying something about how like most of the research requests, especially since I don't have a great knowledge, uh, like a good grasp of, of like higher level, um, statistical models. I just like simple correlations, some bend analysis. And if there's nothing there, then like usually kind of leave it. Cause a lot of them are just like, mm, I wonder if these yeah, are a little a lot bit more related or not. Yeah. yeah. All right. You trying, you trying to get after on the way to ball study? Just get it, baby. Yeah. On the on the twelfth boy to ball study we'll present on this podcast. Twelfth <laughs> of uh fifty five coming up. Way to ball training, acute effects. You trying to share a screen? Who with it? Okay. Like to do. Oh, another another sorry, uh just a quick interjection. Another update from last week. We started workout employee workouts on Fridays. We just do a ridiculous CrossFit workout with uh, some of the other employees in the gym. Very fun. What time are those I going am down? in so much pain. 
uh, during the employee lifting slot. I think it's like two two forty five or, or like right around between two and three. All right, word. Two to three a.m. Yeah, dude. Two to three a.m. Beast. Okay, I think I was on a. I think that was when I went to make a bike ride. Okay, which where I'm from. Hey, 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 bro. Listen, you can take off that studs book mark off the top. All right. And, and you, you can go ahead and just use that for about a year. RP. I think that goes directly to like the 2018 stats or something. RIP. All right. The weekly journal article review. Uh, this one actually chose because uh, it's by Mike Reynolds. He actually presented. He gave like a five minute talk at abs. Um, on it. So again, if you want to see that presentation, it'll be uploaded to the ABBS YouTube page. Um, you'll be able to view it there and check it out. Um, he, he gave some like info on it, but this uh, this piece have I have either of you seen this? Like previously, I've, Caravan, you said you hadn't. I had not. Also, I looked up ABBS YouTube, but I accidentally typed abs YouTube. So I got some fire <laughs> 10 minute workouts on my, on my other screen. Nice. Nice. I haven't, I haven't read this in depth, but I saw it a little bit. One quick question. What's an MPH? Miles per hour. Interesting. I thought you were trolling, dude. No, dude. Oh, Monica, that I, I don't know, but I, I have uh, looked that up uh, previously. Oh, oh yeah. I thought MPH as a title. Yeah. Jeez, dude. Come on. You guys are just Monica insulting Drogos. me a lot. That, that sounds a little health? bit Eastern European, dude. I, I, Monica Drogo sounds a little... I think she might be like my cousin. I think, it's I think it might be like, my cousin. It's some sort of public health thing, I want to say. Master of public, mm. Master mm. Of public health. Anyone want to Google Sorry. it real quick? Check Sorry to... D- oh, yeah, I'll, I'll hit it. Just Google that real quick. Anyways, uh, Reinhold presented no, this. I'll, this came out... Uh, this is less than a month old. I want to say it was like the end of June. Uh, you said you said Reinhold presented this. Reinhold presented this end of June, June 2020, uh, is when this came out. With uh, obviously working with you know the the usual batch of people who are just pumping out uh, biomechanics research and uh, some weighted ball stuff. Glenn Fleisig on the board with uh, Dr. Andrews Macrina, and yeah, Dude, Drogos, I, I, I forgot where you screen share. I kept trying to scroll down on this. <laughs> Drogas. Um, yeah. So this was, they, they've done a few pieces on a uh, weighted ball research. Like there was a six week study. Um, and then a, a few others like that, looking at, you know, velocity increase, injury rates, all those things. This is actually really interesting. I'm pretty stoked about like looking at the acute effects of like implements and, and training modalities. So the kind of like, TLDR, which you can get from the abstract two, was three sessions, overload weighted ball session, normally weighted ball session, and an underload. And it was randomized conditions. You went in, you had internal and external passive um, range of motion tested, went through the throwing session, and then it tested it again. So, and that was like randomized, to, to see the differences. I think it was, yeah, 16 participants, uh, high school baseball players. So yeah, it came in, measure your IR and ER, uh, throw whether the underload throwing was uh, five, four and two ounce balls. The overload throwing was five, six and nine. And then the extreme overload was five, 16 and 32 ounce balls. So that would be like the baseball, the green ball and the black ball. I think on those uh, thirty-two ounce, two pounds. No, I the the black. Oh, the green ball. The green ball yeah, is yeah. 16, yeah, yeah. We're all sixteen. Yeah, so that's that's pretty. The green ball is one pound. The green ball is uh mm-hmm. one kilogram. No. No. The green ball is a thousand balls, grams. Black ball is one kilogram. The green oh, ball yeah. is four fifty. No. Yeah. Green ball is no, four fifty. Blue, blue ball is four fifty. Oh, the blue ball is four fifty. The green ball. Green is ball 1, is a yeah. thousand. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's so embarrassing. The, you'll, you'll get to spot out. So that out. would actually be, yeah. So that would actually be the baseball, blue ball, and green ball, five, sixteen, and thirty-two. Yeah. Yeah. So the, um, yeah, they came in. Uh, it was like a standard warm up. I think the warm up was pretty limited from from when I saw the methods. Uh, it was like standard theraband, 
warm up and then yeah 15 reps uh, at each movement and then 10 throws at 45 feet 10 throws at 60 feet 10 throws at 90 and then they went into the throwing session which was either with the underloads the overload or the extreme overload that consisted of three throws with each ball at 100 percent intensity from knee rocker and run and gun so that's that's how they went about it after that session they then measured uh ir and er again and i'll just scroll down to the results actually um you guys see these results wait wait wait, wait. do you mind scrolling up right before before the i had one question uh i figured i i'd I want to ask before do you guys scroll this a little bit uh, lower so the, the uh yeah right here um, do you guys know what the coracoid stabilization technique is? Yeah, the uh, coracoid is basically just what he's doing with his uh, left and, and right arm right there. Guy on the yeah. left right here. Yeah. Stabilizing it um, to like standardize the measurement. Is there any negative? Is, is that, does that leave much uh, inner no, tester liability or is that, is that pretty standard? Okay. Pretty standard, yeah. Actually, I do want to point out one, one thing I really liked about the, the methods and including this is uh, this section right here. Reliability of range of motion testing was assessed yeah, yeah. in a pilot group of 10 nice. participants in a previous study. So they nice. took measurements uh, to get like the ICCs and make sure that there wasn't a, wasn't gonna be any like reliability issues uh, with, with the IR and ER measurements. So that's that's really cool. I think that's pretty tight. Especially, when, also- especially when working with a goniometer. Like I'm always skeptical of like, range of motion and, and like FMS data from like just someone throwing a goniometer uh, up there. So, so that's pretty, that's pretty sweet. I, th- I think uh, as far as um, I remember from the goniometer and range of motion studies that I've looked at, the, the intra rater reliability is pretty high, right? Yeah. Like, like, sim- like the same person will measure pretty consistently. Yep. Yeah. And I think they mentioned that there was, like a team of two or a team of three that did it the whole time as far as the measurement. So yeah. if there were, if there is inter greater reliability, then it's probably, there's only like two. Yeah. But yeah, I mean the main, their, their main hypothesis was that as the ball weight increased, um, that external range, external rotation range of motion was going to go up. And that's, that's what they saw in the dominant, um, arm, External rotation significantly increased in the overload group by 3.3 degrees and also in the extreme overload group by 8.4 degrees. Also an interesting one, uh, in the extreme overload, non-dominant ER, non-dominant ER. So glove arm ER went up almost three degrees, which was significant, which I think is like, yeah, very, um, very odd. So, so, so they basically got the, uh, each week they would get test, they would get measured again, so then weeks, immediately three throw weeks of testing and they yeah. would do one of these each week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, and then, and then, the, and then the test right after. Randomized. Yeah. They would one? test right after they tested before and after each session. Yeah. So each day. Okay. So they, Cause they were looking at the acute effects. Right. Yeah. So what, what do you, what do you got? Uh, uh, the on the regular overload, the before mean is like really high, way higher than the other ones. Yeah, that was significantly almost, different, right? Yeah, almost significantly different than the others as far as just before goes. Yeah, that's what that's uh, that kind of concerns me. If like before there yeah. could be that much of a difference, and yeah. like that is bigger than the magnitude of difference they saw afterwards. Yeah, and between it's also the smallest standard deviation. Um, in the before groups. Yeah, um, that's a good point. So yeah, no, I think I think that's that's pretty interesting. Thought that was a point. I mean, they, I mean the in the discussion or in the results in the discussion they talk about it like they confirm their hypothesis, which is like what you would expect, right? Like uh, you are gonna throw like a heavier ball. Um, I would, I would anticipate some like acute effects. Like, I think I would anticipate that in any movement with putting like an overload implement somewhere, like increasing acutely, uh, some range of motion Their Um, conclusion as far as like the interpretation, uh, was right here. 
Um, and they may provide a neurophysiological desensitization of the GTO mechanoreceptors, um, Golgi tendon. I, I know only three of the words in that sense. Yeah, so it's like Golgi, Golgi tendon or, organs, mechanical receptors may decrease protective mechanism of the shoulder, uh, internal rotators. Uh, GTO, like the most common example of that, is um, your, like, when you go to the doctor and you get your reflexes tested on your knee, you know, they like tap your knee. Yeah, kick your knee it's like out. a stretch that's, reflex. That's what the GTO is, basically. So, like, when that's your, like, knee, uh, that, like, tendon is getting stretched, and it's your body's like, oh, we're hitting, like, end range of motion. Like, we need to tense up. We're going to, like, blow something out, you know. So that's what that <laughs> mechanism Dude. Dude, when I, when I was when I was like ten or twelve, and I go to a doctor and they do that, I, I, I thought it'd be badass to try to suppress uh, my knee hopping out because I, I didn't realize I didn't like fully process what they were doing it for. So I do my very best to suppress any sort of reaction. So yeah. they just tap my knee with a thing, and I would just like hold it because yeah. I'd like see it coming, and they'd be like, oh, "Okay, you got no reflex." And I'm like, "Oh, that's not that sick." And, but but <laughs> <laughs> it's like, "Oh, nice, dude, you're broken." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so That's I think, uh, the, the, I mean, the other thing they noted in their conclusion, which is, is a good point, use of heavier balls should be incorporated with caution as both increased shoulder rotation injury rates have been observed. The uh, reference for that being their previous six-week study, which showed um, the, like, people using the overload implements had injuries, and, and range of motion should be monitored. I, I'm not... I'm still not entirely sold on like, like I, I think if you can, yeah, range of motion should be monitored um, during the implementation of these programs. I think that uh, like the, I guess the workout that they went through, it seemed pretty excessive to me compared to what we do. But if there is anyone out there using weighted balls in that kind of like capacity at that uh, level, they 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 should probably like tone it down, especially that like, especially if they're not onboarding properly. Like, there are not okay. going to be any high schoolers that show up to drive line, throw ten throws at forty five feet, ten throws at seventy, ten throws at ninety, and then just go straight into a hundred percent green ball. You know, running guns, rockers, knee throws like that. That's just not going to happen. And like, in no way should should anyone out there uh, be doing that. It should be like properly onboarded, on ramped into them. And, Hope that this study is, you know, basically just more potential like evidence and argument for that. One thing that I would like to see that I'm I'm still not sure on is all, all of this is based around passive range of motion in IR and ER, like on the table, um, and it's not looking at active range of motion in the throat. So I would really like to see if if there, since there was an eight degree increase in passive range of motion um, for dominant external rotation, we're really interested to see if there was also going to be active uh, external rotation increases, like kinematically, in the pitching pitching throw. That would be what I want to see because yeah, the, I don't know if they didn't, didn't mocap anything then, like huh? All the time when we do like movement screen to biomechanics yeah. data or like yeah. you know range of motion to biomech we just don't see the carryover from table to pitching mound that you that you'd expect and we're going to be doing a study like an actual controlled study on that once we get uh the lab fully rolling again i think it's going to happen in the next few weeks but so those are those are kind of like my main uh thoughts on it initially um I think it's I think it's gonna be really tough always with when, uh, when did this get published? Uh the twentieth of June, I think. So it was nice. a, less than a month old. I, I think did it's your did your tough with these with the methodology. Um it just seems like pretty consistently the methodology is a bit more aggressive than anything we do in gym, so it's really hard to take the results from this yeah. and apply it to what we do. And I, I think you're gonna run into that all the time. I think like that's gotta be pretty common in like uh exercise science journals and like strength and conditioning journals in general which is just another reason why if you're a reader of articles and stuff like these like 
very important to understand the methodology and the programming that went into the study because like we could put someone through an insane like squat workout right we just do some like 15 sets of of 20 at like an absurd you know percentage of of, of yeah, that's what maximum. i do you know that's what i do and then we could show that like there's some sort of like negative effect or positive but then in the title of the abstract it's just like effects of you know squats on heavy volume lower half range of motion right like the implement in this instance the weighted ball it is just that <laughs> it's just a modality it's just an implement how it's used is way more important than than what's being used and so you know there, there there could always be something in there to kind of like look at that so uh in general and obviously like i mean we're pretty biased because we sell with job but in general like i i disagree with demonizing or targeting the the implement or the modality as opposed to how it's implemented the programming around it i, I think that's a much uh bigger point that, that we need to pay attention to and it's always going to be a tough thing for studies because there's no real like standard program out there that's like throw this ball this many times at this type of intensity that kind of thing. there's a couple of things uh one thing that Dang, you got so loud Dang, you got dude. so loud Me? relax dude i'm talking normal volume dude oh, it's I just not mike i think your mic might wanna... super weird yeah it's just yeah. not asmr anymore guys okay okay yeah um continue i one thing with goniometry okay. that uh worries me a little bit is that like the tester has full control over the results, you know, so they are the ones that are measuring the range of motion, but they're also the ones putting you into that range of motion. So like it would be easy if you were to have a, that's a good point. Like yeah. if you were to like think or expect this outcome, it would be really easy, even implicitly to uh, bias. Knowing. Yeah. Bias. How, how, like, how much you, you put somebody into some pat yeah exactly you could stop at some point or you could just put a little bit more force or allow a yeah. little bit more like uh upper like torso movement to like look like there's more er i'm not saying that's what happened I, that's something that uh worries me with goniometry but then uh the other thing with your comment about you'd like to see active like in the throw uh external rotation or, or uh, shoulder rotation range of motion and something with uh, these results are going to be published in studies that we have um, that are currently in the writing phase, but we haven't found any significant difference in maximum external rotation between ball weights in either of our controlled studies. On yeah. it. So uh, we didn't measure passive range of motion during these studies uh, before or after, but uh, we did uh, one of the metrics that we look at is maximum external rotation. So um, that, Something we can you There's can factor really in as well. About the goniometer, have you have you ever used one, Caravan? No. I think oh we... no, I mean, I mean, I mean, I think I've had my ROM tested. I think yeah. actually Jager's likely our first guest. Now that I'm looking at the results after Lindley's retweet, um, Jager's still holding on to. Ooh, I think in the gap closed a little between Jager's and Dan though, about a four percent four percent lead rather than a six percent. Yeah, uh, I think Jager's used one on me. Yeah, I think I think I got twelve degrees of motion. Yeah, range well, motion. when you're when you're doing it, it's kind of like yeah. uh, like Lindley, you've you've used the goniometer a few times. Yeah, it's just like a weird. Um, you just know, you just keep pushing and stuff, well, or you what? You can, you know, you could kind of like keep going, kind of a thing. Uh, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of tough. It's kind of tough. You know. Do you it's think like there's any reason besides just like l like they probably didn't have they didn't want to mocap everyone? Is there any other reason they wouldn't have mocapped? Uh, they probably just yeah, probably just would. I think their main thing was looking at, they wanted to look at passive ERIR. And one thing, one thing that is also worrisome about that specific case is that they did a previous study. They found there was a change in external rotation. So they were already hi hypothesizing like a, like a one tailed difference yeah. between the two. So like they're already like the, the experimenters kind of knew uh, that they were, what they were or were expecting to find that so yeah the, and the, the 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 other thing that i will say is that like the more external rotation equals injury risk increase it is is something that we we don't see in our data set and i i'm i'm skeptical that there's enough evidence uh out there still for that i understand that that was the uh, a big conclusion of, of the six-week study was like 
external rotation increasing and the, the injury rates increase there as well. But um, in, internally, we're just consistently seeing that as active MER goes up, velocity and their efficiency increases well relative to that velocity. This whole injury rates thing, and we've mentioned this a bunch of times, it's just super, super tough. You just don't have the injury rate. And there's so many things that can go yeah. into it. And I'm, yeah. I'm going to like, I'm going to always be skeptical of this one thing is why this person, you know, got hurt. And that's from like me and my past two injuries. Like it's, it's going to be really hard for me to ever just like see en enough of the data and be like, okay, yes, this one acute metric and reason that the range of motion of external rotation on the table is the reason why elbow popped or popped that kind of that, that's kind of, a, that's a far claim for me. Kind of on that topic, uh, Dr. Oliver from in at Auburn University, uh, she's in charge of that uh, biomechanics lab. Yeah, she presented on some research that they did in softball, and they used pain as the independent variable. So, like, they would bend athletes by they've had or they struggle with upper extremity pain or they struggle with lower extremity pain, like and uh, that. Like measuring it on a scale of one, one to 10 or just binary? I think it's binary, but like, I still do think that pain, like subjective feedback is a valuable tool in the whole injury risk or injury, um, like conversation, uh, because, because having some, like, it's hard to quantify it. So like doing it subjectively with surveys or whatever might be one of the better alternatives or a good start for like, uh, trying to figure out uh, some of the movements or some of the red flag, uh, like things that, that athletes are going through. That's what I got. What do you got? Anything? That's all. Caravan, That's episode 23. I, any, any linear regression comments? I was going to say, uh, no, I was say next episode, we'll have our guest, our first live guest to react to abs, this study and my Kara chat and Lindley <laughs> and Lindley Lindley's followers slowly dwindling. Slowly dwindling. I'm speeding up, bro. Just like I told you in standups, my derivative is strictly positive. Strictly yeah, I mean, positive. I mean, I mean, so it's mine. It is no, but low. like more, more positive than yours, dude. More positive than yours. You are gaining followers, but I'm gaining more followers than you. Might not be enough, but I'm still gaining more followers than you. And on that note, follow me on Twitter. Go follow. We're out. Uh...